There you go. Good. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Miami Torah Center. And tonight we are talking about understanding why. And this is a question this weekend we're all going to ask ourselves, being that the ninth of the month of Av is actually this Shabbat. And since Tisha B'Av falls out on Shabbat, and Shabbat is a Torah obligation to relax and to enjoy, for that reason, our sages said when Tisha B'Av falls on Shabbat, it's pushed off to the 10th of Av. Again, so the term of Tisha B'Av, Tisha means nine, B'Av in the month of Av. So we're in the Hebrew month of Av, and this Saturday is going to be the 9th of Av. What is the 9th of Av? What does that mean? We're going to go through all of those, those details and, and, and understanding what happened and why it happened. This is what we're going to dedicate tonight's class to. So again, just important to note, this year Tisha B'Av falls on Shabbat. Last year did the same thing. And Tisha B'Av is going to be observed on the following day on the 10th of Av. So what happened on the 9th day of the month of Av, our sages teach us, the Talmud brings it down, Maimonides brings it down, that there were five calamities which took place on the 9th of Av, all on the 9th of Av. The first one we spoke about a couple weeks ago, we spoke about last night also in the Zer Shimshon class, and this was the sin of the spies. This is when the Jewish people requested for Hashem, sorry, requested from Moses to send spies into the land of Israel to scout out. And to make a long story short, they went, they scouted, they came back, they had a negative report, and the nation cried. God said, are you crying now? This day is going to be unfortunately a crying day forevermore. And this was the onset of all hardship and calamities to take place on the 9th of Av. The fact that the Jewish people cried in vain for a gift that the Lord was giving to them, the amazing land of Israel. That's the first thing that happened. It happened in 1312 BCE. Okay, that's a long time ago. It's towards the end of the 40 years of the Jewish people's... Uh, sorry, not towards the end, towards the beginning. Sorry, towards the beginning of their, uh, their exodus. Now, second year? Yeah, very good. Very good. So then they had 38 years left. Good. The second year to them leaving, that means that was in the year 2450. Because the giving of the Torah and they left in 2448. So 2000, from the creation of the world, from the year 2450 is when the Jewish people were then sentenced not to enter the land of Israel and along so that this day of the 9th of Av would be a very hard day. That's the first thing that happened. The second horrible event that takes place on Tisha B'Av is the destruction of the first temple. The destruction of the first temple happened, again counting from the creation of the world, in the year 3,388. 300, 3, sorry, 3,338. Okay, and this was done, unfortunately, by the Babylonians, the Babylonian king led by Nebuchadnezzar, and he unfortunately destroyed the first temple, and this happened also on the 9th of Av. There were 100,000 Jews approximately killed, and millions which were exiled. Moving on to the third event, Unfortunately, this was the second temple that was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed in the year 3828, and it was done by the Romans and Titus. Titus was the one who led that. Over there, there were much more Jews killed, opposed to 100,000. There were 2 million Jews who were murdered this time, and 1 million approximately that were sent into exile. It was harder in that, just in, in numbers-wise, okay? Um, a, a quick... Uh, T tool to remember the years that, that this took place in is that the first, the first temple was destroyed, as we said, in 3338, which the last number is 338, is also the, the acronym of Shalach, Shin Lamed Chet, which give Shin is 300, Lamed is 30, and Chet is 8. Shalach means to send away. Unfortunately, it's when Hashem sent the Jewish people away from the first temple. The second one uh, was done in the year 68 of the Common Era. 
68, today we are 2019. So in the year 68 was when the second temple was destroyed, and 68 is also the Grimatria, the numerical value of Chaim. So we're waiting for Hashem to bring back uh, His presence and our lives back to its opportune. So that's a very easy way to remember already always how many years ago was the destruction of the second temple. You always take whatever year we're in, so 2019, and you minus 68, and that brings you to 1,951 years to the day this Saturday since the second temple was destroyed. The third, sorry, the fourth uh, calamity that takes place on Tisha B'Av was unfortunate. This was 75 years after the destruction of the second temple, and this was the Beitar massacre. The Beitar massacre was a very sad one. Uh, there were over 100,000 Jews killed, and uh, this was a very, very sad. The, the Talmud explains how the blood of the Jewish people were flowing down the rivers of Israel, and it was a very, very sad, sad, sad time. Happened. Uh, two million was the destruction of the second temple. Beitar. I have here that I found around 100,000, maybe more. Okay, many, pe many Jews, very, very horrible. The fifth was when Turnus Rufus plows the Temple Mount, where the temple was, he comes and he plows it down. So it's not, it was not only destroyed already, but he comes and he plows where, where a place where it was considered the Holy of Holies, where God's very own presence resided, was plowed, and that was also another horrible thing that took place. These are the five that the Talmud brings down and that the Maimonides brings down. Since then, there have been many other very tragic events that took place on the 9th of Av, obviously not by chance, and I'll mention the three major ones, and very, very horrible ones. The first is, is the Spanish Inquisition's original expulsion of the Jewish people happened in 1492 on the 9th of Av. Coincidence? I think not. It just can't be. Okay? The next one was unfortunately the onset of World War I, which happened in 1914, also when Germany declared war against Russia, happened on the 9th of Av. And the final we'll mention for tonight is World War II also started on the 9th of Av in the year 1942, and that began with the deportation of Jews uh, to the Warsaw Ghetto and through Treblinka. So the 9th of Av is a very sad, gloomy, scary day for the Jewish people. So this is what happened, and what does that mean to us? So there has been a lot of hard things that happened on the very same day, and just as there are holidays and there's a certain energy in that day and we rejoice, well, what do we have to say about this day? So, before we get into that, we have to just pause and understand that it's very hard to relate to what it means that the temple is no longer with us. And the reason for that is based on a story that a friend of mine emailed to me last year and ever since I think, I think it, it, it just put everything into perspective of a true story. Listen how sad this story is. A true story of a young couple which gets married and they aren't able to have children right away. And they're praying and they're praying and they, they, they're really, really trying. Hashem answers them and she gets pregnant. The wife gets pregnant and she, is, she finds out she's having a baby boy. Beautiful, everyone's happy. Sephardic families are even happier. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens is she's getting to term almost, and right before term she falls ill. She's rushed to the hospital, and she's in critical condition. They're taken by surprise, and the doctor looks at her with a straight face and says, one or the other. And she's like, oh, no, this can't be. She's like, you have to make a decision right now. Either we have to abort the baby or we're delivering the baby and you're not going to make it. One's going to make it and one's not. The husband is beside himself. The mother, in the blink of an eye, says, I will sacrifice myself for this child. There's no, 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 no questions. There's, there's not even a doubt in my mind. Everything happened so quick. The husband didn't even have a word to say. And that's what happened. But she looks at him before she goes. And she says, just promise me one thing. 
promise me that when this child becomes bar mitzvah, that he'll say Kaddish for me. He will say the honorary prayer on my date of passing every single year, but specifically starting when he becomes bar mitzvah. This all happened way too quick for the husband. She passes. He is born. The baby's born, and the father raises this child. Comes the day of the bar mitzvah, and the father comes over to the son and he says, Today you're going to recite Kaddish for your mother. Mind you, the date of his bar mitzvah is the same date of her passing, right? Right. So today you're going to recite Kaddish for the first time for your mother. We have to remind ourselves that the true obligation of reciting Kaddish is not really on a spouse or even to a sibling, but it's really from children to parents. As siblings, we still will say Kaddish, and as spouses, we still will say Kaddish. But the main obligation is incumbent upon a person's children. So he gives the child the book, and the 13-year-old opens the book, and he's reciting the Kaddish. The father comes over to him and he's like crying, tears in his eyes. He's like, how could you be saying this Kaddish with no emotion? So heartless. Your mother sacrificed her life literally for you. And how could you just be doing this lip service? So this boy, in complete innocence, looks at the father and says, Daddy, I can't connect. I never met mommy. She never held me. She never fed me. She never raised me. She never hugged me. She never did anything for me. And as sad as this story is, it is the exact same phenomenon with us relating to the fact that the temple is not here. Because we never had it. We don't know what it was like. It would hurt so much more if we knew what it was like. And having said that, what we're going to present tonight is ways for us to try as much as possible to connect, to envision what it would be like with the temple and what we're unfortunately going through and suffering nowadays without the Bet HaMikdash. To start off, the Magid Miduvna, which was an amazing, amazing teacher from a very young age and he was known to always teach a lesson through a parable. There are a couple of our sages who were known to do this. He is, I think, the foremost known to teach everything. Every lesson he has is always through a story, always through a parable. And people connect to stories because when I tell you a story, you're able to, and the beauty about a story is that everyone's able to envision it differently. Some people add extra details themselves, some don't, some have an imagination, and this is what lends your mind to think of what the, the concept and the lesson is going to be taught. And he was, he was a master in doing this. So listen to what he asks. He asks, why is it, and this is a law, this is a minhag, a tradition that is done in all Jewish weddings, Why is it that by a Jewish wedding, right before the end of the ceremony, we ask the groom to mention the fact that the temple is not rebuilt and that if we forget Israel, oh, forget myself, forget my, if we forget Jerusalem, oh, forget my right hand, let my tongue stick to my palate, how could I rejoice until the, until the ultimate joy of Jerusalem? What does that mention? That I have to remind myself and put on the forefront of my mind, Jerusalem. Why does every single groom at the wedding have to remind such a calamity? Have to remind the destruction of of ourselves of the destruction of the temple? What's the reason for that? He asks. He says, you know that the tradition in Jerusalem, and this is a Jerusalem tradition, that some communities took outside, but not all, is that by a circumcision, a brit milah, not only will the father mention the blessing 
and not only mention Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach, God is, God is king, was king, will be king, and Ana Hashem Oshiana, Ana Hashem Atzichana, God, please, please guard us and help us and may help us to succeed. That also the verse of, please God, don't let me forget Jerusalem, is also mentioned. So the Magid Miduvna, he asks, why by the time of our joy, why is it that when we celebrate a family milestone, that we have to remember the destruction of the temple. Isn't that already set for the three weeks? Between the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av. And a whole day is dedicated to it on the 9th of Av. Why is it that every single wedding and supposed to be circumcisions, we need to remind ourselves of the temple? That it's no longer here? I'll strengthen the question. Do you know that there is a halakha, there's a law, that when you build a house, you should leave something unfinished in memory that the temple is no longer standing. And the rationale makes a lot of sense. It's how can your house be perfect if Hashem doesn't even have a house? The Beta Mikdash was his home. It's where he resided. It's where his presence, his Shekhinah, was more obvious than anywhere else in the world. And for that reason, our sages teach us when you renovate, when you build a home, you leave a foot and a half by a foot and a half square unfinished. If it means unpainted, if it means rubbed out, if it means that it's just not perfect. Now, I will tell you that as a homeowner, you know that your house is not perfect. You know that that toilet is a little bit, you gotta be very careful that way, and that, that sink you gotta be careful, and the garburator you gotta make sure you knock it like a little drum roll if you want it to work properly. Every house has its thing, and that hinge don't, and don't open that window, and if you're gonna make sure you do this, every one of us knows the flaws of our own house. However, when I'll walk into your beautiful home, I'm not gonna know what's wrong with it. It's not only a reminder for yourself that something's unfinished because I don't think there is any homeowner that can <laughs> confidently say that their house is in perfect order because when you start renovating from this side of the house and you end up to this and you gotta start back on that side. It's just never ending. But it's for everyone. It's, it's, it's a lesson for anyone who walks into any home. You walk in and the, the tradition is actually to put it opposite one's door. That the first thing you see when you walk in is not the baby grand piano. It's not a beautiful portrait. It's not a mirror. Ideally, the first thing should be an unfinished part of the house, reminding us that your house is not perfect, this person's house is not perfect, how could it ever be Hashem's house isn't? Having said all of these, all of these different times that we bring the concept of the destruction of the temple into our lives, why in our times of happiness do we need to? Asks the Magid Miduvna. So he answers, guess what? With a parable. This is what he was known for. He says the following. He says, There was once a man who moved into town. And for some odd reason, all of the locals didn't like him. Some said his nose was crooked. Some said they didn't like the way he talked. And just ridiculous excuses, but it doesn't matter. There's not one person in town that liked him. So you know what? They wanted to make him feel unwelcome, but they had a problem. Their problem was, was this newcomer was good friends with the ruler of the city. So they couldn't take him out. <laughs> they couldn't ask him to leave. They could have taxes imposed on them. They didn't know. So they all made a deal between themselves. They said, none of us are going to sell him a house to live in. He's going to feel uncomfortable and he'll leave on his own. And so it was. The newcomer went from one house to another. I'll pay, I'll offer more, more, da, 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 to no avail. So you know what he did? He said, they're not going to sell me a house. I'll have to build a house. That's what we do. So he looked for land which was unoccupied to build himself a house. He finds in between two mountains the perfect landing spot for his house. He spent a couple weeks examining that this was the place and it didn't belong to anybody else. And he set out for construction. 
in miraculous speed, within two months, his house was fully built perfectly. And while he was building, and once he moved in, every time a local would walk by, they'd giggle, they'd have a snare on, a little grin. And he was so bothered, and any time someone walked by, he would ask, Why are you laughing at me? Is something funny? No, 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 no. Is this house not an honorable house? Is this not a three-story house? 10,000 square feet? Is this not an honorable, a reputable dwelling place? No, 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 it looks great, it looks great. And then they just smirk off. Until he got one guy, one local, and he told him, I'm not letting you go until you tell me why you and everyone else is laughing at me. What's the joke? The guy said, if you're pressing me, I'll tell you. He says, yes, you built a beautiful home. But you built your home on a frozen lake. (laughs) And in a couple weeks from now, the summer's coming around. The lake's going to defrost. And this beautiful mansion is going to be at the bottom of the lake. And the... Lesson of this story, the Magid Miduvna says, is that anything we build, fulfill, create, succeed, arrive to the milestone in this world today, outside of Israel, and even in Israel, but outside of the realm and the concept of having a temple up and running with God's presence there, is just like building on a frozen lake. Which means it's not everlasting. There's no sustenance, there's no foundation and roots to anything that happens, even good. Anything that happens outside of a world that has no temple, no Bet HaMikdash, is literally, this is something that we have to remind ourselves, is literally like building on a frozen lake. At any moment, it can defrost, it can crack. This is what it means to have a temple. And this is what it means why we remind ourselves when you're getting married, when your children are getting married, when your friends are getting married, when you're bringing your own child into a circumcision to the covenant of Abraham. You know what we remember? Remember, as happy as we are, our happiness is not complete. Because there can never be a complete happiness outside of a lexicon that has the temple part of it, that has the Bet HaMikdash part of it. This is a very, very strong message to us when we ever attend anything that, is, that brings us joy. There was, and there, there is a custom, it's not so common, but there was a custom that even at weddings in Jerusalem, there would only be a one-piece band. You could not have two instruments. To remind oneself of how happy can we possibly be if we have no foundation. And this is something that on the day of Tisha B'Av, we dedicate to really try to connect to and understand Hashem our lives will be incomplete until we hasten the coming of the Mashiach and the rebuilding of the third temple. That is our job. That's our mission. So the Talmud tells us the reasons for the destruction of the temples. And it says that the first temple was destructed because the Jewish people were committing the three cardinal sins. And that is murder, idolatry, and adultery. These are the three cardinal sins that the Jewish people were angering God with, killing one another, committing adultery, worshiping idols. And this is what prompted God to say, enough is enough. This temple is going to be destroyed. You do not deserve me. Seventy years after the temple was destroyed, the second temple was rebuilt. And that is thanks to the story of Purim, right? We spoke about that back months ago. And 
The second temple stood, by the way, 10 years longer than the first. It was 420 years opposed to 410 years. However, it was destroyed, the Talmud says, for one reason. Now, I'm not an expert mathematician, but if one temple is destroyed for three reasons and another temple is destroyed for one reason, that would mean that whatever that one is, is equivalent at least to those three, yes? What can possibly be equivalent to murder, adultery, and idolatry? Anybody? Lack of respect for your parents. Ooh, very good. Very good, very good. That's a very, very, very good guess. So now, That's, that's heavy, but very similar to what the Talmud says. The Talmud says that the second temple was destroyed because the Jewish people had baseless hatred between one another. Hmm. They did not... It, it's worse than they didn't respect or honor each other. They didn't even hate each other. They had baseless hatred for one another. Now when I ask you or when we read that piece of Talmud in Hebrew, it's sinat chinam, free hatred. What does it mean to hate somebody for no reason? That's a hard question to answer. Normally, if you dislike somebody and it evolves to hatred, oh, there's a reason for it. They looked at you the wrong way. They said something wrong to you. They stole from you. They hit you. They... They said something nasty about you. They did something. How is it baseless? To the point where the temple is going to be destroyed, which the only other time it was destroyed was because the three cardinal sins were being committed. That is very heavy. So tonight I'm going to offer, going to present two different interpretations. One of them I've said before. I don't know if this in this form, but I, I've said this before. The second is a new concept, okay? The first is, and we'll spend more time on the second one. The first is from a great rabbi, Rabbi Nisim Yagen, which a lot of his CDs are very famous in Israel. He was a very, very prominent Israeli Hebrew speaking rabbi. And when he writes this and when he says this, and I, and I tell it over to you, it just makes so much sense. He says this is what the, ter the terminology and the mechanism of baseless hatred really means. He says as follows. When someone wrongs you in whatever capacity, the natural instinct of a human being, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just natural, is to have a sense of dislike or even hatred towards them. If someone comes over to you when you're drinking something out of a glass cup and they shove their palm into the bottom of the cup into your face, I think you have right to at least inquire and then realize he did this because he was trying to play a joke on you and he smashed out your teeth and so on. You have right to hate the guy, no? Yes, to reciprocate at least in a feeling of hatred if you don't box his face out. Something, right? Okay. But baseless hatred says, Rabbi Nisim again, Alaba Shalom, he says, that baseless hatred is when you hate the person more than the warranted or the granted amount of hatred that you should hate them for. For example, if someone is driving and they cut you off, not a great feeling, rude, dislike, but to now hate them and to curse them out and their grandparents and their children and to, to use all types of four-letter words, is, 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 is that taking it too far? It's a question. A person didn't invite you to their birthday party. A person forgot to say hello to you or to greet you. And I can give on and on and on and on examples is that a reason to write them off and to condemn them and put them in your box of all the people you hate? Maybe, maybe not. It's a question we have to ask ourselves. And this is a question that few people ask themselves and allow their emotions to get the better part of them. And 
unfortunately start hating people for free because that person only deserved this amount of dislike and hatred or treatment from me and I'm giving them this much. He says that's why the temple was destroyed because the Jewish people, they were acting in a very unnormal way to one another. Instead of something escalating and then just being dying down because it was just small and it was, you know, small talk, it was an honest mistake. No, this person weighed in at 10 times his weight for his crime. Another person weighed in at 100 times his, his weight for the crime. And it just kept on going and going and going until people were really, really hating each other. And for that reason, he says, the temple was destroyed because people were taking things out of context. You cannot think, take things out of context. It's not healthy, and it's just going to create a society which is self-destructive. And this is a concept which I've said before, and this is a concept which to some may be new, to some you might have heard this, but I can guarantee you what I'm about to say now, you have never heard, okay? Never, never, ever, and I can guarantee you anyone you share this with has not heard this. The first part is quite common, and this is the famous piece of Talmud, that tells us what's seemingly another reason why the temple was destroyed. We're talking about the second temple. And this was the story of Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa. Two individuals who, hey, they have a very similar name. It's like saying Goldman and Goldstein, for argument's sake. Okay? They were very, very similar name. However, they were very, very different. Because there was an unnamed individual, the Talmud doesn't give his name, there was an unnamed individual who was hosting a wedding for his child. And he told his messenger, go send this wedding invitation to Mr. Kamtsa. Perfect. Along with another 500 invitations, one of them is going to Kamtsa. The poor messenger made a mistake. And he delivers the wedding invitation to Bar Kamtsa. Is it the end of the world? Listen to what happens. Happens to be Kamtsa, the first guy, is the host's greatest friend. But Bar Kamtsa is the host's greatest enemy. They can't even stand in a room together. They had a fallout, they never fixed it up. Comes, back then it wasn't so long, the next week, they're at the wedding. And the host, the father of one of the children being married, comes into the wedding hall and sees his rival, his enemy, sitting right over there at the table. And the guy's eating and drinking. So what, are you going to put on a scene? Honestly, if it's your, your son's wedding, your daughter's wedding, are you going to put on a scene? Well, he decided to put on a scene. He approaches Bar Kamtsa, his enemy, and he tells him, what are you doing here? So, he says, well, I thought it was so meaningful of you that you actually sent me an invitation, inviting me to come. I never sent you an invitation. Well, yes, you did. I even brought it with me just in case this would have happened. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Well, it's a mistake. You have no business being here. Be gone. Well, he says, you don't want to embarrass me. Let me pay for my meal and my drink. What can it cost? If, even if you're getting ripped off $180, I'll leave you 260 Rests on me. He says, I don't want your money. Pick up and get out. He says, spare me the humiliation and I'll pay half the wedding. The whole wedding, all your 500 guests, I'll pay half. <laughs> now in a louder voice, the host says, get up, find the door. He says, please, you don't want to do this to me. I really, 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 really wouldn't appreciate being humiliated like this. I'll pay the whole wedding. Every single last bill, I won't chicken out. He says, I don't want you, I don't want your money. Get up and get out. And he was forced out of this host's wedding, this unnamed man. 
Now the story's not over. He was so bothered with this that he goes to the emperor and he tells the emperor, this was the Roman emperor, he says, the Jews have turned on you. Mind you, it was peaceful till now, right? They had 420 years of peace. The Jews have turned on you. So the Roman emperor says, the Jews would never turn on me. We're in great relations. No, I'd be sure they've turned on you. I'll tell you how. You know how you normally, and this was true, you know how you normally send a sacrifice to the temple and they take it and they, they bring it up for you and they offer it on your behalf? I don't think they do it anymore for you. They're not on good terms with you. Really, the emperor says. Let's try. He takes a little calf and he tells the man, bring it to the Jewish people. Let me know if they take it up or not. So this man, he was so hurt from his encounter. And, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to side with him and we're not going to blame him at the same time. But he slits its lip. The cow's lip. The calf's lip. He slits the lip and he brings it to the temple. Why would he do that? Because according to the Roman tradition, a slit lip on a cow is not something which makes the cow deformed or defected in any way. However, according to the Jewish law, it does. And according to Jewish law, a deformed or defected animal cannot be brought onto the altar in front of God. Only a perfect animal can be, a healthy animal. So he was playing a quick one. He slit the lip, he brings it to the Jewish people, he says, this is from the emperor, bring it up. So they look at it and they say, wow, we got a problem. If we don't bring it up, then the emperor is going to wage war. If we bring it up just for the sake of peace, so then we're establishing and we're breaking a law and we're establishing a new law. And if we just murder this man, well, then we're going to then we're going to make a new law that anybody who snitches on the Jewish people or anyone who brings a deformed animal to the temple is now liable for death. So they were stuck and they didn't know what to do. So they didn't bring it up. And Bar Kamsa goes back to the Roman emperor and says, you see, they couldn't bring it up. And that's what propelled the emperor to wage war and destroy the second temple to the point where the Talmud says, it's because of the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa that the second temple was destroyed. This is what the Talmud recounts to us. The Iyun Yaakov, which is, yeah? Oh, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. The Iyun Yaakov, a commentary on the Talmud, he asks, I think, a very fair question. He asks, why is the blame of the destruction of the temple... Sorry. Why is the blame of the destruction of the second temple... Blamed on two individuals, Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa. Wasn't it really only Bar Kamtsa, the second guy, who's the one who snitched? It should be because of the story of Bar Kamtsa that the second temple was destroyed. Not the story of Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa. Good question? It's a great question. Listen to the answer of the Ben Ishchai. The Ben Ishchai says something which is absolutely fascinating. He says... That Mr. Kamtsa, the friend, we have to assume that he made it to the wedding, that he was there. Because after all, it was a small town, and so he didn't get the invitation, it was his best friend. He says it's highly unlikely that Mr. Kamtsa, the good friend of the host, wasn't there. He was definitely there. And he says, because Mr. Kamtsa didn't get up, and he didn't, Spare the poor guy who has a similar name, the humiliation of being picked up and thrown out of the wedding, he's at blame as well. But now let me tell you something even deeper. 
and he says, the Marsha, the Ben Ishchai says, the Marsha, another commentary on the Talmud says, do you know what the word bar means in Hebrew? In, 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 bar is an Aramaic word. How do you translate bar into Hebrew? Anybody? Yes. Ben. It means son. Son of. son of. Very good. Let's get this right. If the first individual's name was Kamtsa, who's bar Kamtsa? His son. His son. So wait. The Ben Ishchai says, one second. Mr. Bar Kamsa Sr. Sorry, Mr. Kamsa Sr. was the host's good friend, but his very own son was his enemy. Mr. Kamsa, the father, is to be blamed for not making peace between his good friend and his son. And for that reason, the Talmud says, it's Mr. Kamsa and his son, Kamsa Jr. It's because of those two people that the temple was destroyed. Mind you, the Talmud says that Bar Kamsa, the snitch, was so hurt from the fact that the sages, that all the rabbis, all the important people, all the other guests were there, and none of them stood up for him. That's what made him get up and go snitch. It wasn't because this guy only humiliated him or hates him. You can live with one person hating you. You can't live with public humiliation where there are quote-unquote great people present and all of them silent. And because of that, the story of the temple, the destruction of the temple was destroyed because of these two people, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. It seems like there's a common theme with the destruction of the temple. And the common theme is as follows. That inaction and apathy are concepts which are not condoned by God, condoned by Torah. Being a bystander, pulling back, showing disinterest in another is not a Jewish concept. And we're going to develop this idea. Before we develop it, where do we find the first time in our Torah the word sin'a, hatred? No, we don't find it there. Hatred. No. No, no. The first time. Now, why is it important? Rabbi Tzadok Hakohen, a great Kabbalist, an amazing author, he writes, and Rabbi Akiva Tatz, Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz, nowadays, he should have a long life, he also says that finding the first time in the Torah that a certain vernacular is used is the defining theme and definition of that word. So that's why this question is important. When is, because if we're learning sin atchinam, baseless hatred, that means I want to know what the word hatred means. Where? I'm not saying there was no hatred or jealousy there, but I want the word sin'a, hatred. Here's a good one. Go to Parshat Vayetze. Jacob leaves his parents' home. Where does he find himself? The Midrash says he goes 14 years to learn in the, in, in, in the tents of Shem and Ever. And then he arrives somewhere. Where does he arrive? Lavan, his eventual father-in-law's house. He arrives there, he works seven years. Who is he married to? He thought it was Rachel, he actually marries Leah. A week later, who does he marry? The one he intended on originally marrying, Rachel. You know what the Torah says? And I quote, I'm in chapter 29 in Genesis, verse 31. I'll read it in Hebrew and then in English. Vayar Hashem, and God sees... That Leah is hated in the eyes 
of her husband Jacob. Vayiftachet Rachma veRachel Akara. And God opens her womb, she becomes pregnant right away. She has four, one after another. Boom, boom, boom. However, Rachel, the loved wife, her womb is closed, she's not getting pregnant. So God repays Leah for being the Sinua, the hated one. Comes the Ramban, the Nachmanides, and he asks, <laughs> Can you imagine that our patriarch, which is alluded to as our greatest of the patriarchs, the finishing off the seal of the trilogy, that he hates another person? One second. That he hates his wife? Yeah, anybody? No, that doesn't make sense. Therefore, the Ramban explains. He says that the word sinu'a does not mean that Yaakov hated his wife. It means that the love that he had for her was weaker. He was disinterested in her. Now, tonight we're not going to spend why. We did speak about this, but just on one leg, it's because his true match was Rachel, and Esav's match was Leah, his brother. He had to marry both because Esav messed his life up. He missed his boat. But rightfully so, seemingly, Jacob... Sin'ah, Sin'u'ah, hated, not hated, had weaker amount of love for his brother's wife that he had to marry and that he was tricked into marrying by his good father-in-law, right? Based on this, we can now give a new definition to what Sin'at Chinam is. Sin'at Chinam is not limited to active hatred. It is, there is sina hatred, which is active hatred. There's also a concept of inactive hatred. Being disinterested, being a bystander. That means when you see another Jew suffering, you see another Jew having a hard time, you're able to advise someone, you're able to spare them, you're able to be there for them. You're able to be there when they're having a hard time, when they lost a family member, or when their business crashed. You're able to be there, right there with them, and commiserate with them. Sina could be just pulling back. It doesn't mean stepping on them and squishing them. That's also hatred. But a certain type of hatred is also, based on tonight, inaction, disassociation, disinterest. Being a bystander. I remember when I was in high school, and nowadays they do also, but in high school, like in every high school, there was a bullying problem. And they taught us about a concept, which to us was a first of, the bystander effect. And how the bystander effect is liable, just like the person committing the crime. Maybe a tad smaller. Yet the way they teach it and they impress it as it being even worse than the one committing the crime. Because if you see something, you don't say something, it means you are condoning it. And based on this, you know why the temple was destroyed, as the, as the Talmud says, because of Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa? It's because Mr. Kamtsa, along with the rest of the sages which were present at that wedding, all fell into inaction disinterest to stand up and spare this poor man's face of humiliation. And what this means to us is, well, if the temple was destroyed because of this, that means we better stop doing this. If we continue doing it, how do we ever expect the temple to be rebuilt? So there's two lessons of what it means that the Jewish people had baseless hatred for one another based on tonight's interpretation. The first is, as we said, it's hating someone more than they deserve to be hated. I'm not saying go around hating people and disliking people, but even if you're gonna, keep it within realm. That's number one. But I think number two is a lot deeper. Number two is don't be deaf to the situations that you are exposed to. 
when you see something, when you see someone, when you're able to do something, stand up to, for someone, we have an absolute obligation to do so. If not, you are inactively hating that person. And how could you do that? Every Jewish person is either your brother or your sister. We are all related. If you would have stood up for your own family member like that, really we should be doing that for every Jew. And this is what's not allowing the temple to be rebuilt. And it's very, very serious. The Talmud says that every single year that the temple is not rebuilt, every generation that the temple is not rebuilt, it's as if we are destructing it ourselves. It makes a lot of sense. Because if we would have fixed up what the reasons were for the destruction, well, then it would be here. We have to remember that every single time we zip our lip and don't speak Lashon Arab, slander, baseless hatred on someone else, every time we don't harbor feelings of hatred, every time we stand up and we're not a bystander and we are actively helping somebody, what we are doing is we are putting a brick on the wall of that third temple that's going to be coming down. That's a very, very important concept. And every time we don't do the right thing, well, we are holding it back from being built. We are destructing it ourselves. So I want to review the five laws that we observe on Tisha B'Av. And again, it's going to be this year starting Saturday night from sundown approximately 8 o'clock here in Florida, all of the following are going to be observed. The first is no eating and drinking. The second is no bathing or washing. The third is, and this is only for 25 hours, okay? The third is no anointing with any oils or creams. The fourth is no putting on leather, no wearing leather, leather shoes. And the fifth is no marital relations. These are the main five. By the way, these are the same five that we've learned from Yom Kippur. In addition to it, which is what makes Tisha B'Av kind of harder than Yom Kippur, is there are additional laws to be fulfilled as well. And that is number one, the way we sleep should be different. We should sleep without a pillow, or if you sleep with two pillows, sleep with one pillow. Some people put their mattress on the floor. Sitting on the floor, until the midday, we sit on the floor. We don't sit on a chair. We sit rather on a cushion or on a towel, not directly on the floor. Again, like a mourner. Mourners don't sit on chairs. These are all reenacting concepts of mourning. Mourning over the loss of the temple. We're not supposed to and we're not allowed to work on, Yom, on, on Tisha B'Av. We shouldn't stroll around. We're not even allowed to learn Torah. Torah brings us joy. And you're not even allowed to greet somebody. You can't say hello or goodbye. Now think of it. Again, it's kind of like that mother you never had. It's so hard. You never had the temple, right? But if you really, really, really experience a life-shattering, a tragic moment... God forbid on that day, whatever day it is, would you have a smile ear to ear? Would you say hi to everyone you see? If someone would say hi to you, would you even answer them back? No! You wouldn't walk around. You wouldn't sit on a comfortable couch. You wouldn't eat. You wouldn't drink. You wouldn't want your comfortable shoes. You wouldn't care how you smell. Honestly speaking, and that's what we need to try as much as possible to connect to on this day of dedication to remembering the temple. The Arizal, which we all know, the most amazing, one of the most amazing sages that the world has ever seen. The Arizal actually, by the way, never wrote. He had his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, transcribe all of his teachings, all of his lessons during his life and post when he passed away. In Shar HaKavanot, which I actually have a copy over here, he goes through a lot of Kabbalistic traditions of, a, of the daily life and of the life cycle of a year. Whether it's daily prayers, Shabbat, 
the holidays, the way we eat, all the practical things we go into, and they're different traditions, and this is the Kabbalistic traditions that he brings down. However, when it comes to Tisha B'Av, he has a very, very small portion. In this edition, it's only half a page. It's literally a small paragraph. So what does he have to say about it? You know, sometimes a short message means a lot more than something large and something big. You know, sometimes like a, like a, like a, like a phrase or a quote speaks more than a whole volume. So what's his paragraph? What's his dedication to Tisha B'Av? He asks a great question. He says, We sit on the floor al Tisha B'Av, but midday we get up and we sit on chairs. And the Talmud recounts how from the midday of Tisha B'Av you're even allowed to get into the kitchen and start preparing food for the end of the, for the, end of the fast. One second, isn't it a day of mourning? And one second, the Talmud says that actually the destruction took place on the 9th of Av, but the burning, as, as horrible as that sounds, the burning of the temple took place towards the afternoon of the 9th of Av and continued into the 10th of Av. And we, midday, when the temple was burning at that time, 1,951 years ago, we're going to now start sitting on our couches, and we're going to start preparing our meals. How insensitive is that? He asks. Furthermore, he says, if we look at the prayers of Mincha, we're actually saying verses of consolation of Nechama. What's there to be consoled about yet? It's still in the middle of the, middle of the day. So look how he answers. This is, I guess, the, the, the beauty of, of always being able to look at the cup either half full or half empty. Look at what he says. He says that when the Jewish people saw the temple destroyed, they were destroyed. They really, really, really felt horrible. They, again, <laughs> they had the mother and then they lost it. They had the temple and then they lost it. But they were very scared. They thought that they were all going to die and that the Jewish nation was going to be completely wiped out. The Arizal says, as soon as they saw that the temple was being burnt down to the ground, they were, and I hate to say this, they were relieved. They were happy in a certain way. How come? Because they saw that God allowed His wrath and His anger to go out on sticks and stones opposed to them. The brick and mortar opposed to them. And this is again why Moses never entered the land of Israel. Because if he would have built the temple, God couldn't have destroyed it. He would have had to let out his anger and wrath on the Jewish people. So they had a certain sense of consolation, of nechama, when the temple was being burnt. He says, that's why midday we get up and we sit on the chairs. Why we start preparing for the breakfast. Why we wear tefillin in front of everybody. Meaning, in the morning, some have the custom that the men don't wear tefillin at all, only in the afternoon, and some say you wear it at home in private. Tefillin is, is it's a crown. But we wear it in the afternoon on Tisha B'Av. This is what he says. He gives another answer. He says that, this is a short one, he says that Mashiach is going to be born on the afternoon of Tisha B'Av and he will be named Menachem which means consolation to be consoled and for those two reasons he says that the afternoon of Tisha B'Av is already transcending into something good and something positive I want to end off with I have a lot more and that Hashem will spend Tisha B'Av together before we end I want to Remind everybody that on Tisha B'Av, we're going to have this beautiful pre uh, video presentation, which uh, really is going to give us some more insight into the day of Tisha B'Av, into what it means to not have a temple, and what it means to have to actively try to bring it back, and that's by our interpersonal relationships between one another, and 
amongst the best rabbis in the world are going to be featured on this uh, on the on this video. So we're going to be having there's a program A, program B. They're both different. The first one's going to be showing at 4 p.m. over here. We have a projector set up on our plasma screen TV over here, and we uh, are going to do the first program at 4 p.m., the second program at 5.45, followed by afternoon services. Men will be welcome to bring their tefillin, and uh, maybe we'll do even a break fast altogether. So everyone is welcome. That's going to be at 4 p.m., and we'll share something else then. In the meantime, I just want to close this up by tying it to this week's Torah portion, which tomorrow night's already Shabbat. The book of Deuteronomy starts off with Moses berating and rebuking the Jewish people. And he comes down on them hard and he mentions no less than seven of their shortcomings and their faults that they have done over the past 40 years. However, an amazing question. Why did 40 years pass? God intended that the whole generation that exited Egypt will not enter, that they'll all perish. There'll be a generation change. Good? Who's Moses now rebuking? He's not rebuking any of the sinners. He's not rebuking anyone who faulted. He's rebuking their children and their grandchildren. So what's the whole point? The Sfat Emet answers in a genius way. He says, there's a concept the concept is called Zechut Avot, merit of our ancestors. That means, do you know why as Jews, in whatever capacity we are, we are so successful today? If you think it's because of you, that's shallow. Rather, it goes back, dates back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of our amazing ancestors. The paths that they have paved for us we are just continuing, we're just building on it. It's like, imagine they built a structure in quicksand and it's a solid foundation and we are able to build on it. If we'd come with our petty tools to try to build on, on, on quicksand, we get sucked up and finished. That's the concept of zechut avot. However, there's a flip side to that coin of merit of our ancestors. And that is a concept of also being punished for what our ancestors have done. And the Sfat Emet says, it's two sides of the same coin. You either take the coin or you don't. Either you'll take the merit of your ancestors, but you also have to unfortunately bear the, the burden and the weight of their faults as well. But there's a way to get rid of that. It's by correcting it for them. That means if you don't follow in the wrong ways of your ancestors, whether it's your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, doesn't matter, whatever it is, then you have now corrected their fault and their wrongdoing. But if you just follow in the same habit and the same mistakes, you're not only going to be punished for you doing it, you're going to be punished, compounded, for your ancestors who also committed them. Just like zechut avot, merit of your ancestors. It's when you do something good, it's now exponentially worth more because you are relying on all of the merit of the previous generations who've done it. It's got to be a fair game. And for that reason, the Sfat Emet says, you know why Moses is coming and he's rebuking the new generation? He's warning them, don't fall into the same complacent slave mentali mentality lifestyle that your ancestors had. God specifically changed over them and wiped them out and created a new generation to enter the land of Israel, one befitting. But don't make the same mistakes. This falls in line perfectly with what we mentioned that the Talmud says that every generation the temple is not rebuilt. It's as if we're destructing it. That means until we correct the faults of our ancestors, until we restore Ahavat Chinam, baseless love to eradicate the baseless hatred we are actively causing the temple to not rebuild and destroying it and that's why and it's one of the reasons why the Torah portion of Devarim the first Torah portion in Deuteronomy is always read preceding Tisha B'Av every single year the Sfat Emet says for this very lesson 
that we have incumbent upon all of us to rectify the faults of our ancestors, bring back love, harmony, unity, and baseless love to one another, to our families, to our friends, to our communities, and to Am Yisrael and the whole world at large. Make this weekend, which the 9th of Av is Shabbat, and the 10th of Av is when we're observing Tisha B'Av, make this weekend a meaningful one. Make this weekend a weekend of contemplation of what we've lost, what we need so desperately, and most importantly, how we can help towards that cause and bringing it closer. Amen v'amen. Yes, questions. Uh,